All right, well, we're going to talk about IPv6, and we have learned a whole lot uh, in the past few months, and uh, I think over the next couple of years, all of us have still got a lot to learn, and so that's one of the primary things that we're going to try to convey to you this morning, that this is an absolutely new animal, it's a new beast, um, you know, it, it's, it's like you're, you've been eating glaze your entire life, you just turn around and you get sprinkles, it's, it's really different, and you've got to be ready for it, and so... Uh, we got four reasons here. Yeah, four small with a billion. Right? Jump, jump right in, man. Tell them about all the right. mandates. All right. So we got a mandate coming next year, June 30th, 2008. The uh, United States uh, government is supposed to be IPv6 compliant. So we're going to talk about what that means uh, and whether or not it's going to happen. Address space uh, is uh, one of the most uh, interesting questions right up front. You're going from about four billion addresses to almost an infinite number of addresses. Yeah, shoo. 340 undecillion. That means, you know, almost everything can be addressable. So we're moving into... Uh, There's 37 zeros. Like a sci-fi realm of uh, telematics. So, you know, we're combining the entertainment industry, the emergency, you know, incident response. You know, basically your uh, windshield wipers uh, will get it, receive an email from the, you know, the weather, you know, channel. You know, check, you know, if you're heading towards the direction of the storm, it'll know your GPS, you know, your coordinates, and it'll check for your windshield washer fluid and, you know, make sure that, you know, tell you to pull over and, you know, hey, refill, because in an hour you'll need it, you know. So, um, and, uh, oh, and security con concerns, woo, I mean, that's, uh, that's scary. I mean, the bottom line is uh, we're going to increase the attack surface by orders of magnitude, right? So imagine everything with a battery having an IP address. Uh, the idea is to have a host-to-host, -host, you know, end-to-end -end connectivity. So, you know, things will have global IP addresses, you know. There's going to be no more NAT um, and, you know, privacy issues uh, and... Uh, All right, talk about the new paradigm. It's blowing my mind right now. <laughs> okay. Well, I, just, I already told them about new, the, okay, the, the windshield go. wipers, yeah. Um, oh, actually, well, we got a little treat for you guys. Uh, so, just to, you know, just to hook you in, I'll switch over to the... Uh, okay, so on this screen, once it, okay, well, I guess we got a, with a VGA cable. Huh. Don't tell them about the air. Jump in. I'll switch this thing around. What do you mean, tell them about, what do you mean, tell them about, Agby config? Yeah, I'll tell them about the air, continue about the. Oh, the V6 air, all right, we're going to jump back while he's uh, uh, hitting F5 there. Um, okay. Completely different, as we as we mentioned before, the extensibility is huge. There's all sorts of room built in uh, to do to do new things and to apply uh, the protocol in, in different ways. You ready to go? Uh, yeah. Why don't we switch over? We got a little treat for you guys here. This is uh, uh, the latest version of uh, Microsoft uh, Vista Beta 2. I picked up picked this up on Wednesday at the Microsoft booth. I don't remember what the build number was. It was kind of long, but. I uh, installed it on this little uh, car pewter, uh, you know, basically a little, you know, mini uh, ITX based, uh, you know, machine that, you know, could do GPS and email and, you know, Microsoft Office and boot Linux and, you know, do whatever you want in your car. Uh, but right now it's running Vista, so I'm kind of new to this. It's got a snazzy, snazzy interface, and, you know, beautiful graphics. You know, you get this default. All right, uh, go. Go, man. Oh, okay, okay. All right, so let's dig around a little bit. Let's dig around. Uh, we got a... <laughs> Let's, uh, let's jump into IP config, see what that looks like. Uh, Everybody done IP config before? You know what it looks like? Yeah. All right, so basically uh, in Vista, IPv6 comes, by, you know, comes installed by default and it is enabled. In XP, it, the support is there, but it's not enabled. So you got to basically type in IPv6 space install and boom, it'll, you know, two seconds later, you, you know, it's running. But in Vista, it's already enabled. So the way you can check it is uh, you just do ping, you know, colon, colon, one for loopback and woo, it's there. You can do the same thing on your XP box, except you got to type ping six space, you know, colon, colon. Uh, now, unfortunately, this network, you know, we, we, we weren't sure if they could support V6 tunneling, because obviously it's V4 here. We were going to use a transition mechanism to see if we can connect to a V6 website, but it seems like the goons, you know, well, they tried. They really they tried hard, so, you know, we thank them for that. But it looks like we don't have connectivity, but uh, one good test you could do is, uh, is, is try to ping uh, wwipv 6 day dot org. On there, man. Okay, I, I knew I shouldn't have had that beer. So that comes over V4. Uh, you can four six dash six flag. Woo. I'm sorry guys, I'm trying to look lopsided here. Does that look right? Okay, I got a space there. Thank you. Ooh, so the address resolved. Look at that. 
but we can't reach it because I think they're, you know, they're not allowing tunneling here probably. It means you got to allow protocol 41 tunneling or allow Teredo, maybe they're blocking Teredo ports, so we'll get into that. Uh, we could also try to paste this address into the, uh, you know, into Internet Explorer. You got to have the little square brackets now. Imagine that. Ooh. It's not coming through, but last, last night from the, ooh, what's that? Looks like we got connectivity all of a sudden. So this kind of quirky, obviously this is beta, right? So now it's working. So that's kind of cool. Let's go to uh, let's go to IP config again. IP config dash all. All right. Well, look at all that. What is all this stuff? On, you know, on by default. Okay, so we have. Okay, we recognize this part right here. Okay. Uh, okay, we got Teredo on. Okay, one second. I think it's all there. Yeah. Got all kinds of new stuff now. Three and five. I mean, this is on by default. I didn't set any of this up. This is just a fresh install. All right. Well, I guess uh, we got enough uh, digging around here. Let's see if we can pull up that site. Okay. Something's not coming up. Well, we maybe we'll get back to. It. We'll play with it later. Let's let's jump back to the slide. But anyway, this was a little treat for Vista. This was a totally unplanned, you know, experiment. We want to show you. Vista's got this stuff, you know? Okay. okay, so just hit the vulnerable on this slide. You know, IPv4 is already at a stage where they can charge you for every, you know, a lot, a lot of uh, services. They're saying, okay, another five bucks and we'll give you another address, right? Well, with V6, you know, there is about 50 octillion addresses for every human on the planet. Uh, so if IPv4 is about the size of a skyscraper, IPv6 is about the size of 400 billion planet Earths. Dude, this is your slide. Whoa, okay, so, so, we, so we have a, actually a chance to start fresh. You know, IPv4, nobody thought it would last that long, you know, 20 plus years, almost 30 years. And the idea, you know, it wasn't designed for a large network. It was kind of built ad hoc, you know, nodes one on, you know, on top of another. Now we have a chance to start fresh, you know, with V6. So we could do hierarchical addressing. We could allocate blocks in, you know, in a specific manner to, you know, to, you know, expedite routing. And, you know, here you can see that, uh, you know, we're going to have, you know, an orbital net, a sub, you know, subsurface net, interplanetary net. So you got to get in line to get your, you know, IP address from Mars now. So basically, you know, based on your prefix, you know, you, you'll be able to tell, you know, what network, you know, you, you, know you, you can exist in. So, I mean, totally new, totally new approach here. So tell them, tell them why some people, you know, hate this thing. Okay, there's plenty of uh, critics. We don't want to sit up here and pretend like this is a really great direction or this is the only direction we have to go in. Um, there's, there's sort of a lack of a migration strategy, and a lot of people are really frustrated with the fact that it's, it's an alternative. It's not an extension. So you can't really say, I'm going to go um, slow and slow toward IPv6. You, you actually have to do sort of, a, of an about face and, and move in a new direction. But then a lot of people are upset about that, but that's actually that's part of the point of it, is that there were all of these shortcomings of IPv4, but there are all these things we wanted to do in the future. And so the new uh, protocol is meant to address the, uh, the bad old stuff and, and the new possibilities. Yeah, so we track through the, the history a little bit. Uh, you know, IPv4, again, was very resilient because it was very simple. It was, it was kind of dumb, as some of the founders have called it, and that's why it was resilient. Uh, you know, back in the day, there was actually a controversial battle between the gossip protocol and the, and the internet protocol. Gossip was heavily government backed. Uh, it was very bloated because you know contractors and vendors you know could definitely make a buck on making it more bloated, right, and providing support. But uh, IP won. So you know, question is, is IPv6 uh, you know another you know government backed you know protocol or you know you know is it hype? Is it just hype? Will it die? Just like maybe you know service oriented architecture. I mean, things come up all you know left and right. So you know, let's let's take a step back and you know take a look at the big picture. Uh, the bottom line is we are running out of uh, V4 address space. You know, some countries like India, you know, you have to go through nine levels of NAT. You know, and you know, and there, and you know, some third world countries have a uh, IP address space that's less than you know a, a given American you know university. So, uh, you know, bottom line is uh, you know V4 you know is old and maybe it's time for a change. Um, in fact, NAT was you know NAT, NAT was created as a workaround to you know to. Uh, 
to solve the address space problem. And you know, some people rely on that for uh, security, which uh, don't ask me why, but you know, but at least maybe for obscurity. But okay, but okay, and and uh, now you know, two bright individuals, you know, proposed the next version. You know, uh, almost you know more than ten years ago now. So V6 is not brand new. Um, actually. Some trivia, V5 was just a, you know, audio video streaming protocol. They accidentally named V6, V7, but some, you know, they caught the mistake. And obviously the goals were, you know, to expand address space, you know, optimization of routing, uh, it, a lot of customization and uh, security in mind, of course. So uh, here's, uh, you can see the two, you know, lines in uh, V4 and V6 in parallel. Yeah. Uh, basically, you know everything from uh, you know the the first exhaustion pr prediction in early 90s, of, you know of the address space, to the uh, you know next generation of the internet you know proposal, uh, and finally uh, you know some government decisions uh, to you know to get their networks to be compliant or be able to provide you know support. So there's a lot there's a lot where that comes from too in terms of what is the definition of compliance? Uh, does it mean that you actually run you know v6 traffic or are you just providing support? So there's many definite you know. Uh, uh, you know, much confusion about definitions. So, well, okay, I don't know if it's too early for math, but <laughs> I'll try. Uh, okay, we got some big numbers, but the bottom line is uh, each person on Earth, right, 6.5 billion people, could have 50 octillion addresses to themselves. Okay, so I, don't know, I hope that wakes you up. Yeah. Um, so, uh, towards the bottom, you see uh, some, you know, V6 addresses. This is the first time you, you've seen one. Uh, they're long. Uh, and uh, you can actually. Uh, How long does it take to type one? And can you make a mistake when you're typing one? Yeah, I typed myself uh, three days ago. It, it took me on average uh, 30 seconds, and I was trying hard to type a full v V6 address in. And then after I typed it in to validate it, you know, quickly back and forth before I hit enter. I mean, if those of you with keyboards in front of you, just. See, see how long it would take you, you know, type in a full address. Well, you can't see with the zeros, but imagine a complicated address. You know, I feel bad for the guy that has to do, you know, ACLs, you know. Uh, you know. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, jump back one sec real quick. Uh, so you can catenate by doing a double colon. Uh, so the two addresses uh, towards the bottom are the same. Um, and uh, Kenneth will talk more about privacy, but let's, let's keep moving. So... Okay, we got you know your standard graphic. Here's you know you can notice some differences. Uh, there are some fields ripped out uh, from v, you know V4 to v, you know V6. V6 seems uh, much more elegant. Seems simpler. Just we have a quadrupled uh, source and a and destination address uh, space. Uh, you know towards the bottom you can see that uh, uh, the uh, the one fundamental difference is the next header field, which actually moves the header options to to, uh, uh, to the payload section. So that makes it very uh, flexible. So now that you have uh, in the payload section where you put the data, you can come up with your own types of headers. So that 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 allows for much customization. So uh, and you can also daisy chain headers. So you can put one header, then you know next header field, another header, next header, and so on. You could have as many you know nested headers. So that that actually is fun when you start playing with tunnels and you start encapsulating tunnels within tunnels. And woo, okay, let's let's keep moving. Package structure. Ah, uh, okay, so. Okay, well, we covered the extended headers, and uh, you know, you could again improve quality of service. Uh, one fundamental di difference is uh, fragmentation is done uh, on the host, on the on, on the destination host. So it's no longer done on the routers. Okay, big difference. Uh, so routers now will uh, grab the uh, fixed uh, packet headers, which are at 40 bytes, uh, not like not the variable length headers in V4. Uh, you know, read that and make a routing decision. They will not have to parse the packet. Okay, big difference. Um, there's you know there's all kinds of complicated jumbograms and uh, advanced features in V6 that you know you can go read about. We can you know spend there's there's hundreds of RFPs at this point RFCs. So, whew, yesterday uh, we tried to stump the panel a little bit. Uh, one of my buddies uh, asked the following question at the TCP/IP drinking game. I don't know if the, I don't know how much V6 uh, traffic they get, but uh, that was a long question. You know I, it was worth ten you know drinks. And uh, I don't remember what the answer was, but they had to do something with extension headers and hop by hop jumbo grams. Okay, so it's whew. okay, so it's uh, okay. And um, some differences uh, from you know v4 to v6. Uh, uh, there's no trace route alternative anymore. So those of you you know old schoolers that were used to this to the uh, IP you know record route option, you can't do that anymore. 
no broadcast address addresses. We have uh, complicated multicast addresses. So, you know, again, the multicast, you can spend a whole college semester on that. Uh, but, you know, the bottom line is, uh, you know, it's, uh, you can broadcast uh, to specific groups of IPs and to, you know, within, um, within a network. So it's, it's like your limited sub-broadcast um, sub groups. Uh, no uptime check anymore, so okay, so that's uh, gonna hurt us with scanning a little bit. And, but the header's still in the clear, so whew, good news. Okay. And, uh, you know, you hear a lot of uh, talk about built-in security with V6, so, you know, that's your silver bullet. Well, you know, they're most, mostly they're referring to IPsec, okay? Uh, so that's an encryption, uh, I mean, that's a crypt cryptographic, uh, you know, protocol. And um, the bottom line is uh, what mandatory IPsec for V6 means simply is that uh, if you're writing a V6 stack, you have to provide support for IPsec. Doesn't mean that the network will automatically run IPsec. So the bottom line is, you know, your, your, your V6 stacks out there will have IPsec support, but how many people will actually use it? I mean, IPsec, uh, you know, there, there's, a, there's a public key, uh, you know, algorithms involved, and if, if any are familiar with trying to deploy, you know, a global public key infrastructure, you know, you gotta solve that problem first before, <laughs> before you try to introduce IPsec, you know, global, you know, brokerage of tunnels, so. Um, I'm sorry? So the question was, what about opportunistic encryption if it's available to uh, to a specific host? So uh, it, it is it is it is not that hard to set up tunnels between uh, you know the idea is to have host-to-host -host connectivity. So you can set up manual tunnels between you know you and somebody else on the other side of the planet, or somebody's toaster or refrigerator, and the traffic will be encrypted. So you can manually set up tunnels as long as the network will allow for for you know IPsec tunneling. So. Uh, that is allowed. The, the problem is it's not scalable because you're deploying them manually. So you need to have tunnel brokers that can negotiate keys between two hosts and between each session. And if you're running, you know, two web browsers and you're, and you're looking at ten different web pages, you got to have a different key for each session. So imagine that on a global scale. So, okay. <laughs> well, there's a. Um, uh, IPsec was actually uh, cr originally created for V6 in mind, and uh, it was backported in V4 because V6 was, you know, so slow and getting rolled out that uh, it was backported. Uh, so the idea again is to have, uh, you know, if we can start fresh with the, the new model of internet, we could we could try to have, you know, trust tr trust in a network where, you know, w through the use of tunnels, y you know, you you know who you're talking to. There is authentication and. Uh, the idea is to create a trusted network, so as opposed to V4, where everything's kind of ad hoc. The gentleman says very few BGP sessions are encrypted with IPsec. So there's some, you know, some more from the trenches. So, you know, good luck deploying IPsec, but we'll see. Let's move it. Let's move it. <laughs> yeah, who's gonna control the keys? So Especially, well, we'll get to that in a second, but on the international level, who, who is going to control the keys, right? And so that's a huge limitation, the widespread implementation of this stuff, because once you get to the nation state level, one country is not going to allow another country to control its keys. There's uh, plenty of, uh, use your imagination in terms of the pros of IPv6. Because it's extendable, you know, you think of ad hoc networking, you know, mobility, the ability for you to have your own unique, unicast global IP address that you, you can, just, you know, you can pick up and travel to, you know, cro travel across seas and uh, plug in a network and you have the same exact global unique IP address. So, you know, use your imagination. And uh, again, if we start fresh and we do it right, if addresses are allocated correctly, you can you can think of it as zip codes. You can have prefixes. Uh, you specify you know ha, you know have relation to a specific you know geospatial you know coordinate for a certain group of v, uh, v6 addresses. So imagine a thousand you know different users from uh, you know an enterprise going you know surfing uh, say you know a web server you know uh, at site B. Um, well, that's a in v4 traditionally you know, there's no way to kind of con you know, there's no an automated way to control the sessions. They can, there's to be thousands of different paths. In V6, you can have bulk sessions. So the idea is to have all those. Why not have all those thousand, uh, one thousand sessions? You know, viewing a you know from a browser, you know at site eight, you know viewing a, a server at site B, 
why not bolt them together and channel them through the most optimized path? So I mean, the idea is to you know approach it from from that perspective. Mobile devices, everything, everything. Telematics, we mentioned earlier, the idea of combining, you know, you know, entertainment, uh, you know, incident response, emergency systems, everything with a battery to have an IP address. Okay, there's also obviously some, you know, some negative aspects that you know, come to mind right away. Again, some people are disturbed by by recognizing that there was no more NAT. You know, some people rely on NAT. They love NAT. That's you know, that's that's probably sometimes that's their first layer of security. Uh, there's no more net in uh, in v6 uh, well they actually you know the, there are some exotic ways to, to 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 do that but there's no point you know if you have 50 octillion you know addresses just to yourself um, there's uh, there's many migration technologies uh, uh, that during the uh, during the phase of uh, introducing v6 traffic into your network you're going to end up having v4 and v6 at the same time so now you got to think about how your sensors will you know, watch traffic on both stacks. Well, how are you going to watch tunneling? I mean, there's, there's many mi migration will increase the attack surface. You know, by orders of magnitude. Um, there's a uh, IPsec tunnel. IPsec is great, but then what about uh, what about the sensors? What about negotiating the keys with you know with the sensors, with your IDSs, with your firewalls, with your host-based solutions? Now, if uh, you know if you have encrypted sessions, you know, end to end, your your sensors are blind, so you got to you know include brokerage mechanisms that will share the keys for, you know, with the sensors. So, uh, and that's, that's complicated stuff. Ooh, I'm getting scared. Okay, let's move it. All right, so we kind of given you a, a, an introduction uh, to some of the issues that are, that are at play on the, on the tech side, but anything this important uh, on the tech side, you can imagine, has, has significant implications for governments around the world, national security issues, uh, ability to sort of control and come to the aid of your populations, uh, to control military forces, to run expensive satellites uh, in space. Uh, one thing, you know, often say DOD drives uh, technology, just like, you know, NASA sort of drove so many things, you know, over the past you know, few decades that sort of came out uh, into everyday life. Um, warfare, uh, that said, it itself, like everything else, is, is completely networked today. So, so the very nature of warfare uh, is, is network centric, you know, down to the number of bullets and the sticks of butter you have uh, to give to your troops. Um, all of that needs to be controlled uh, via, via the networks. Now, obviously, for a military, that, that's going to lead to a better operational picture and more flexibility um, in the battlefield. At home, uh, a big question is whether or not this is going to allow governments more or less control over their own populations. And the question is, is important, but also very philosophical in nature. I mean, from one standpoint, you say, great, we're moving to the encrypted internet, so my private communications are going to be secure. On the other hand, there's going to be more static IP addresses, right? And so it's going to be easier to track you back. And we'll talk about the, the People's Republic of China and how they're uh, viewing IPv6 as important to their, their national security uh, picture. Uh, in the real world, uh, we, have, we have emergency response uh, issues that, that, are, are, that are very important, uh, not to the, the top level of national security, but to the folks who, you know, who run law enforcement and fire and, and, and uh, um, disaster uh, recovery. Uh, so one of the one of the uh, important uh, examples is called Metronet Six, uh, and again the the the, the basic uh, thing in it incorporates metropolitan network IPv6, is uh, short for um, is that handheld devices for pretty much everybody who's involved in uh, emergency uh, uh, response disaster recovery. Uh, available, uh, you know, year-round that would connect everybody. And one of the important aspects of this is ad hoc command centers. So, you know, in Washington, D.C. Or, or anywhere else, uh, there could be sort of from the top all the way down uh, secure communications uh, between folks. And, of course, this is, you know, pre-9-11. There was so much flack. You know, the, the CIA and the FBI didn't speak to each other. Well, they spoke different languages. They didn't trust each other. Um, if, if implemented correctly, you could see how IPv6 would lead to more trust. You know, you could you could even uh, have you know a, a sort of a, an intel group talk to a policeman on the street, right, and pass them information securely. Hey, look behind you. The IPv6 mandate. Uh, so a year from now, June 30th, 2008. 
uh, you know, there is uh, a significant element within the United States government to decide this is important enough that you're going to do it, period. Um, it's interesting in that after that, another major body responsible for looking at IPv6 turned around and said, whoa, this is, not even, this is not even a good idea at the present time. In fact, if we do it too early, it's going to lead to increased uh, costs and reduced security. Uh, the, the two are the uh, OMB, which is associated with, with the White House, and it, we're operating on a, a White House uh, initiative uh, in the Department of Commerce, which was looking at it from, from more of a tech perspective. America and companies uh, really is in a funny position, right? Uh, you would think that they would be driving this, uh, you know, for many reasons, for market share and for research and development. However, they're kind of stuck with the lion's share of IP addresses, right? So they've got so many IP addresses, they don't know what to do with them. And they still have her sort of fully natted, so that's sort of an irony of the thing. Uh, but we've got, we got a ton of IP addresses. I mean, just for example, Stanford University has more IP addresses than China. So there is, there is uh, uh, not really a shortage on the American side. There are reasons, though, to switch to IPv6. Uh, companies are very interested in reducing the rendezvous servers and the developer time that's necessary to do all of the coding that is involved with natting. Uh, so when, you, when you're developing you know, Xbox games, when you're looking at Vista, all of this, very expensive to develop. So IPv6, they see as a way uh, to increase you know, the, the, the facility of uh, allowing P2P uh, connectivity. Uh, and so to, toward that end, Microsoft's under, offering $100 million uh, for developing uh, software and programs that would fit this model uh, for Vista in the future, in case you're interested. Let's move to the uh, People's Republic of China. So, you know, in the United States, uh, the shift is ma mandate-driven currently, right? Well, in many other countries, it's, it's purely market-driven. They need the address space. You look at India, it's worse than, you know, China. But you look at uh, in China, you know, okay, they, they already don't have enough IP addresses for everybody who's online. Uh, but... Uh, you know, they need, uh, it, they need the space uh, in, a, in a serious way. It's also a big uh, effort as China modernizes very quickly uh, to develop a serious indigenous in intellectual property, and everybody's participating. They are somewhat sluggish to date, and, and really the prime, the prime factor, and this is somewhat disappointing for the uh, Chinese IPv6 team, is that there's just lack of applications. And so, you know, you can see how that's, that's, uh, that's a problem. So finally, uh, in regards to the PRC, and, and it's not just to bash the PRC, but it's, it's, this is a problem for all, all nation states, is sort of the balance between, you know, uh, privacy, consumer freedom, and, uh, and the, 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 the need for law enforcement uh, to prosecute crimes. So in the Chinese case, uh, you know, we've got some things to look at. Okay, they already station police at internet cafes, and they're already on the lookout for things like sweatshop videos that will indicate that they're, you know, they're not playing fair by international uh, labor laws. Um, and then on the criminal side, you have them openly saying IPv6 is important for us to assure that we reduce crime uh, in the country, and it's specifically through the better, tr better tracking of individuals through static IPs. Uh, some colorful stuff uh, between America and China is you see a lot of uh, collaboration, a lot of acquiescence uh, between our major com uh, companies because they want the, the market entry into China. And there's no way they're going to get there without uh, providing China with what they need, just like Microsoft provides them with the source code, right? Uh, in order to, for them to buy the operating system, they're not going to buy it otherwise. Um, you know, Google and Yahoo, they have, they have helped uh, prosecute individuals uh, in China, you know, by offering, you know, personal information uh, uh, upon request. Now, at least one com uh, con U.S. congressman is, you know, comparing this to, to World War II uh, collaboration with the Nazis. Uh, Europe is moving forward. They, they, this is, this is uh, um, much more market-driven. There's a lot of investment there. Um, they've got some of the same stuff we've got going on on the emergency response side uh, and some of the same issues with, okay, we're, we've come this far, so what now? You know, can we have more money to invest? Or they don't really, you know, there was complaints that they didn't see the, uh, the, the visible, uh, tangible rewards uh, so far with, with IPv6. Uh, 
Here is a, a concept car, uh, and again, IPv6 makes these things possible. We talked about it earlier with the, the windshield washer fluid, but really you, you can network everything, right? And so you can be plugged in uh, to, to many different things. You can even have uh, you know, ad hoc network connectivity, everybody in the car, and then between cars. You know, if a car is approaching you too fast, you know, you could know that. If your if you're, you know, son is 16 years old, is driving too fast, it sends you an email quickly, right, and lets you know. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of possibilities. The Japanese side is different from, from the, Chi the Chinese example in that, uh, you know, in China they need the address space for, for people. In Japan it's, it's electronics, right? They've got so many things. It's an absolutely gadget crazy country. So they want to address all this stuff so it can talk to each other, so it can talk with the companies, uh, so, you know, so they can talk with their friends. Uh, so they've been at this for a long time. You know, as early as 2000, they identified IPv6 as critical to, you know, to the future of, of an e-Japan. Uh, and they do hold uh, the world records, the uh, University of Tokyo, both in IPv4 and in IPv6. And they're, they're putting money into, you know, a taxi pilot program so, so that when, you know, visitors and when, you know, travelers come in, they can see the immediate value of, of the new, of the new uh, network connectivity. Um, in India, it's very interesting. Uh, I just mentioned one thing, you know, so, so the, 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 um, the, the companies uh, want to have a V6 test bed, right? And so there's a bit of a controversy on whether or not they're going to open it up to the world or have it sort of a, a, as their own, their own thing. Obviously, uh, the major international telecoms providers want, want to play in this, but there's a big element there that, that want to keep it close hold and, and, and uh, you know, pay uh, just real close attention to, to national security issues and um, sort of uh, proprietary information there. Um, South Korea already owns trillions of addresses. Um, this is a, it's an issue, say, for instance, for Africa. Africa, there's a lot of countries that really benefited from cell phones, satellite phones, VSAT, all this stuff was really beneficial uh, because they didn't have a lot of landline in countries, right? So this is a huge step forward for them. And in the same way, uh, IPv6 should also help certain countries uh, with really no, with hardly any uh, network connectivity at present, there's going to be plenty of addresses to go around. Okay, here's a, here's a slide. I just thought I would check quickly to see, uh, you know, within government donate, domain. So we have .gov, right? Well, France has gov.fr, and every, every uh, country has, has their government uh, address space. So these are the IPVC, IPv6 hits within the address space. So I was a little bit surprised, but this was as of yesterday. The USA came out on top, but maybe, maybe a bit of a surprise, uh, the uh, South Korea came in, came in second, uh, but very, very close. Uh, but then you have China, Japan, Taiwan are all next. What does that tell you, right? Asia is seriously investing uh, in IPv6. Some countries, I mean, it's shocking. Czech Republic, I mean, if you've ever been there, what a, what a terrific place, right? But uh, zero hits, nah, none. You, you none mistyped it. I think you mistyped it. I did not mistype yeah. it. I did not, mis I did not mistype it. I checked, in fact, several, several uh, different ways. So interim analysis, okay, is very different, you know, between the PRC and the USA, right? Um, there's a lot of investment in China. It's very visible. They talk about it all the time. It's crickets on our side, but uh, you have to realize that the different economic models uh, very much pertain here. And in, and in China, you don't do anything without government support. So it could very well be, and we talked with a, a real big shot in IPv6 world, who said that the behind the scenes American industry is almost certainly the, the number one spender and investor uh, in IPv6, you really just don't see it. Uh, so it may, it may be just slightly different, different models here. In our country, the, you know, in the United States, uh, it is going to be more market driven and we'll see how that plays out. It's going to cost money, for sure. And you may be wondering, what's this going to cost my, co my company, right? Uh, so the Department of Commerce report, which was more technical in nature and, and, and really got more into the weeds, uh, said if you have eight core routers, 150 switchers, and four firewalls, it may cost you $2 million. But yeah, lots of other people saying this is absolute nonsense. You're going to take care of all of this for no money at all. It's all going to happen within tech refresh, right? So you know, hardware, software that's coming out now is IPv6 compatible, right? So you're primarily going to have to invest in some training and in some uh, awareness. Uh, and one of the things we're going to suggest to you later is that maybe your organization just taps a couple of folks to get up to speed on the IPv6 issue. Because it's not, not going to, it's not going to do you any good to jump in with both feet, but you're just going to want to watch this issue uh, and know where you should be. 
there's a real interesting comparison between Y2K and IPv6. There's a lot of people who think that, you know, that it's way overblown and then you're better not, pay, you're not paying any attention at all to IPv6 and it'll just go away. Uh, but almost certainly it's going to require some smart resource decisions on your part and there are going to be some niche admin skills such as typing these long addresses that, that may come in handy. <laughs> on the privacy side, there's just differences, you know, and some of this is cultural. It's real interesting. A lot of times when you look at, you know, uh, warfare, espionage, uh, you know, politics, police work, a lot of culture comes in. And so in, in Asia, they're going to have they're going to have a less of an expectation in general for privacy in your daily life. In some languages, privacy, I think my wife studied Chinese for years uh, and I can't quite remember now, but I think in the languages you, you don't even know how to describe privacy, right? You don't even know where to begin because it doesn't exist, right? Uh, so, you know, in, in Europe, you know, much more. There's some sectors that absolutely demand it. Um, in our country, you know, we still have the death penalty, right? So, you know, we, we love our privacy in this country, but we also feel like, oh, if he's a criminal or we think he may have committed a crime, shoot him. Well, actually, it might be worth mentioning. Uh, <laughs> it might be worth mentioning that uh, there is the uh, EUI-64 uh, field uh, in, the, in the address where you take the uh, lower 64 bytes and uh, essentially you uh, rip off the Mac of the, of the, of the NIC and uh, you insert uh, the additional uh, bits that are somewhat randomized. So you take, you take the Mac and then in, in the middle you slap on some randomized bits to, to create, give yourself, uh, in a sense, you know, pri privatized uh, you know, address. So there, there, is, there is that and it makes it complicated for large enterprises to, to deploy because they can't keep track of their assets that way. So you know, whether, you know, whether that's going to happen, it will be prevalent or not is another issue. So. Okay, internet management, we're kind of running short on time, but basically you've got you know, the registries, you have the internet management bodies, and uh, let me just show you some of what they say. Because we don't know, they're, some, they're just still charting the, the course for this. So it's, it's more like, I want to move in this direction, and we'll figure out how to get there as we go. But some of the things, they, they really want aggregation. Uh, it's, they want a network infrastructure that's hierarchical in nature, and that is, that is planned. Right, and it is not sort of uh, wild west, and, and just you know. Uh, so, part, but that's it's tough. It's tough, and we can give you a couple examples already. It started starting to move in a, in a very um, sort of uh, crazy, crazy way. They want everything to be unique worldwide, you know, so that so that uh, so that it's not behind a net and it's not obscure and it's not difficult to uh, uh, to to, to trace to trace somebody back, which has all kinds of implications. Obviously, uh, they want everything to be registered. They want it to be fair and equi equitable. So, you know, for what that's worth. They want us to avoid wasteful practices so that we don't begin to uh, waste IP addresses as we've done in the past. Now, you can leave that to yourself to wonder whether that's that's really an issue anymore. There is something called the IPv6 Ready logo, and these are the five things that you can actually get tested uh, to, to acquire this logo. Uh, but just a quick search for the logo um, this week yielded plenty of Chinese addresses, and, and more so perhaps up front than the, uh, the English addresses. Um, but, uh, but very interesting here, uh, some people are, are after the logo. One other thing, oh, this is very interesting. The, uh, to acquire the logo, uh, a lot of people wanted IPsec to be intrinsic to it. You know, you got to have IPsec before you get the logo. And the PRC China uh, said, no, no, it needs to be optional. We want the logo without IPsec being mandatory. And they won the debate. So part of the thing to think about here is whether or not uh, you know, other countries or other interested, you know, privacy groups, uh, anybody, somebody, raise your hand, uh, should have weighed in on that debate and argued, uh, you know, the, the flip side and, and tried to win the debate. However, the debate's been settled, and IPv6 sec again is uh, is uh, optional. And ready, ready logo two, I, I believe it's in the works. That might actually have IPsec. I, I think their national community, I think, finally stood up and tried to influence standards. So, something to look out for. The current status of uh, V6 deployment, where is it now? Uh, some of you might have heard of the Sixbone. Well, sixbone.org website, uh, as of, uh, um, uh, I think, first week of uh, July, has announced that uh, you know, they've discontinued, essentially, their project because uh, that uh, first, uh, essentially, experimental test bed for V6 uh, doesn't uh, need to exist any longer because we're moving to the real V6 internet. So the Sixbone has been discontinued. 
Uh, now, you know, now if you go to ipv6day.org, that is a, you know, a quick little wiki to, you know, with some cookbook steps on how to get connected for free right now, today. And so, you know, goodbye Sixbo. Now, now the expectation is that uh, V6 Internet is, uh, you know, spreading, you know, you know, physically, you know, across the world. No, the experimental stage, uh, you know, that that uh, label has been, uh, you know, ripped off. So, uh, again, uh, obviously, we cannot jump straight into V6, and we can't flip a switch. Uh, majority of our networks are V4 only right now. Uh, so I think it's uh, important to uh, distinguish between a difference of uh, tunneling um, mechanisms that allow you to do V6 over V4 networks. Um, there's also a term native V6, which means your hardware can handle v the, you know, the V6 stack. So then you can run dual stack, uh, you know, dual stack hardware, which can talk both V4 and V6. Uh, and eventually, we'll have all native only v6, and uh, we'll treat uh, v4 as uh, you know as legacy. We're going to tunnel v4 probably uh, over v6, but I think that that'll be that, that's you know that's uh, I think light years from now. But I think v4 will stick around for a long time. <laughs> but uh, imagine all the combinations of these uh, heterogeneous environments where you have v4 only, you know, v4 with uh, v6 tunneling, you know, v6 native only, dual stack. I mean, imagine the the, the combinations of you know the environments that could exist. And, and there's, uh, there's obviously some uh, 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 tunneling protocols that are listed on the right. Um, now, uh, you know, what, what exists out there right now that can support V6 uh, um, as of today? Um, you know, mo most companies, uh, there's very few uh, robust stacks out there. Most companies just buy, buy them from third parties. So whether the stacks have been tested, uh, you know, they're still, you know, I'm, I'm surprised that Sixbone is gone. I'm, I'm actually very surprised, but you know, you know, I guess the experts are, you know, expecting that there's some implementation of the stacks that are ready. Um, there's a, 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 it's worth mentioning that um, the, the two um, two uh, Asian projects, uh, Kame and Usagi, um, uh, Kame being um, uh, Japanese for uh, the tortoise and Dusagi being Japanese for the rabbit, in two projects that kind of race to uh, to complete the you know V6 uh, uh, modules for uh, for the uh, you know the Unix kernel for Kami and for uh, you know Linux kernel for uh, Usagi. And uh, as the you know the moral of the story is that Kami finished uh, you know long long before the the uh, the Linux. Uh, Version and Usagi is still very buggy. So Linux support, is, you know, it's out there, and it, I believe after 2.4, it, it, it's, uh, it, you know, it, it's already included. But it is very buggy, especially if you try some of the advanced features like auto configuration. Uh, so uh, the moral of the story is, you know, BSD, you know, finished way way ahead. Right, these are real stories uh, of tech support, right? So huh. you want to try it real quick? Okay. Okay. So I, I'm tech support. I say, uh, hi, this is Comcast. Hi, I'd like to subscribe to your uh, internet service for my residence, specifically uh, IPv6. Sure, why not? Uh, well, could you double check if you actually have native v6? Three minutes later. Do you have a Mac, sir? IPv6 is for Macs. Okay. <laughs> okay. I wish we could record this, yeah, but yeah, yeah. You know, legalities. <laughs> it was, it was legalities. illegal to record it. Okay, Verizon. Uh, Verizon. Same thing. Do you guys have v6? Sure. Could you check if you actually have native v6? Well, you're talking about the mobile internet, where you can com connect no matter where you are. <laughs> no. You, oh, you mean fiber. They're laying fiber everywhere. Uh, well, the medium doesn't matter. Uh, fiber's a plus, though. I, I don't know. You, you need a static IP, but we don't offer that since we're DSL. Uh, I know our sales folks, they told you to call me, but, but they know what we offer. <laughs> well, yeah, they forward me to you. Okay. Um, so obviously, you know your browsers, will, you know will, your applications, will, you know will need to um, need to have updates. Uh, so there's you know developers will will need to learn you know the new protocol. There's you know there's some uh, actually some interesting you know parsing issues now with browsers having to accept colons and square brackets. You know you, you know you can use your imagination. Um, the industry uh, is uh, you know still slow. The the standards are not being you know pushed. We just uh, you know or organizations are taking you know what they can. There's a lot of room for snake you know oil products. It's important I think for large organizations to push for standards for people to speak up because you know right now it's the, the, the you know the industry does not provide much in support. Um, Again, uh, the, you know some some trends to expect. You know, as V6 will come around, you know your average new hires, uh, you know for your network specialists, uh, you know have you know a couple years of uh, you know V4 experience. I mean, I I barely know V4, but hey, I'm a CSSP, so I think you know I'll be able to handle <laughs> the V6, right? Well, you know new hires will have zero knowledge in v, of V6. Um, 
and uh, actually, you know, quick little maybe trivia. Does anybody know what the double colon, uh, the nickname for double colon is? Filled with zeros. No, but you know what it's called? A box? A box? Yeah, no, we don't know. We're just surveying. We actually, because <laughs> well, we had no, to... Actually, we wondered if there's a name for it. We couldn't find one until yeah. for weeks. Okay, there you go. The double colon is a box. Okay, that's cool. We thought we needed another RFC <laughs> for the name because you're going to be saying it so often, you know, colon, colon, colon. What about, what about a, a colon? colon? A colon by itself. Oh, uh, colon. But see, there's two syllables. So there's room there if anybody thinks of something catchy. Okay. Well, we can... Go ahead. Uh, go, see what he said on IPv6? Go by what the Japanese do. Okay. So, okay. Okay, so, you know, where are we going to expect, you know, the, the attack methodologies to, uh, um, you know, to take, you know, to move in what direction? Uh, you know, if, if IPsec will become prevalent, then the certificate authorities uh, that will hold the keys will essentially become targets. Uh, DNS will become an obvious target because that'll be the primary, uh, yeah, uh, you know, primary source for uh, you know network administrators to to keep track of all their assets, and um, you know, especially with the uh, outer configuration and privacy addresses, you know, you you will need you know the DNS will become a, a primary target. So maybe DNS sec. I mean, there's some there's some interesting solutions for you know the, hardening the DNS servers. So uh, you know, we need to look out for that. Um, there's a client-side exploits uh, that, that that essentially addresses the the fact that uh, because of host-to-host -host, you know connectivity and the um, inability to scan large address spaces anymore, you know the idea will be to to target the host directly. So, uh, myriad of uh, security concerns. Uh, actually, uh, uh, if you could switch real quick to uh, switch the box. If we have Vista up, we have a. Let me show you. Some uh, some interesting I found uh, yesterday. Let me pull it up for you. I took a screenshot. Uh, I was just going through the properties in Explorer, and um, we'll wait, wait for it to, to, to boot up. So we actually got to get moving here. Ooh. So there's a lot of link local problems. Uh, that is a that is a very interesting area. Essentially, you could think of your layer two uh, attacks. You know, are, you know, essentially um, being moved up. You know, to the next level. So there's gonna be you know a lot of our, our poisoning, our ca our cache poisoning on the next level. So it's an interesting area to get into. Something something to look forward to. Uh, uh, actually, there's a screenshot. So uh, basically, uh, I went to IPv6 web page, uh, click properties on a GIF, and what is that garbage right there in the protocol? I highlighted that. So I mean, interesting. I mean, granted, it's a beta, but it's that's kind of confusing. Uh, again, large attack surface. You, there's a you know migration will you know probably cause a chaotic environment. And again, the tax service has increased. That's the whole thing. It's, in, you know, it's, it's getting much larger, especially during the period where you're going to have to run both uh, simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So let's keep moving. Uh, the sensors, uh, again, will need uh, key negotiations. So you need tunnel brokers. Uh, there's many exotic ways to do that. Uh, it's complicated. Uh, uh, we can go ahead and uh, you know, move on. There's, um, uh, what are the current hacker tools out there, current attacks? Uh, there's a, there's a suite of tools by uh, the THC group. Uh, Van Hauser uh, has actually published uh, some interesting, you know, the first, I think, IPv6, uh, IPv6, uh, IPv6 uh, attack suite. Uh, it's very interesting. I play with it. Immense results. It's worth playing with. Um, it works. I mean, bottom lines, it works. Man in the middle attacks, you know, flooding the network, a lot of garbage traffic. Um, you know, relaying, you know, sp you know, essentially inserting your, yourself in the in the route, adver stealing addresses, uh, you know, because any any time uh, in outer configuration when you want to grab an IPv6 address, you could ch it checks for uh, duplicate address detection. Well, you can constantly say, oh, I'm it, I'm it. You can constantly grab, you know, IPv6 addresses. So, a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, you know, go ch ch check out THC. There's, uh, you know, I think he, he, I can't do him justice, but it, it, it works and it's worth it. And our next iteration of our presentation, we're actually compiling a list of you know 30 plus tools right now that uh, you know libraries that 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 they could you know that could allow you to do some vulnerability assessments and pen testing in V6. Um, so one of the things just to realize about compliance is it, it's sort of really been watered down and it's, you know, compliance I'm sure initially was, hey, we're going to get squared away with this thing. Now it's pretty much, you know, the core networks are going to need to support IPv6 
and probably the minority of, of networks you know, within the USG may be there by then. Oh, the IP physics ready logo, the politics are highly charged. There's still a lot of decisions to make, and they're very important. Uh, so uh, you want to make sure that you, you realize sort of the, the sort of the, the points of future tension and, and sort of weigh your voice in uh, now. Here's some recommendations. Again, you'll also be on the DEF CON website this week. Uh, but uh, um, you know, these are some of the recommendations that we've come up with uh, for you and your organization. And the bottom line, first thing, first thing is that you probably have, you might have rogue V6 traffic on your networks right now. So go back and check. The first thing is turn it off. You don't, if you don't need it, you know, obviously turn it off and then, you know, then test it, you know, depending on your requirements, allow it you know, slowly for you know, specific purposes if needed. But first, turn it off. Turn off tunneling in V4. You know, even if, you're, if you don't have V6 hardware, uh, your, your tunneling might be allowed. So you want to you block protocol 41. You want to block Teredo ports. And uh, essentially, first, ensure that you don't have any rogue traffic. Because Teredo is certainly worth men mentioning. It's a, it's a Microsoft you know, spec that could essentially uh, exploit NAT you know, through UDP. It can it can give uh, your machine behind an, you know a, a cone NAT uh, uh, a global IPv6 address you know for connectivity. So yeah, I think I think the, a lot of the online games have uh, motivated that. So uh, in, it's funny is in the spec for Teredo, it actually mentions that this should be your last resort. <laughs> okay. Should we the demo slides? Sure. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, I think we're running out of time for a demo, but if anybody's interested, you're welcome to come up and, and chat with us about uh, the V6 pack was our prototype. We actually originally was going to be on a, on, uh, on, a, on a Nano ITX board running embedded Linux, but we salvaged a computer that's running mini ITX. And uh, with, that, you know, with the spirit of telematics, we, you know, the idea is to, we, we have uh, analog sensors with the, um, with the, with the Java, you know, uh, API that uh, if you, you know, lift the, you lift the last beer in your, uh, in your, you know, in the fridge, it can send, you know, an email message, you know, to, to your cell phone. So just, it's just a toy, but. <laughs> right Big now thanks to Dolomite sitting over here for helping us out with the car pewter. He made some of the, some progress on it. But part, part of it is we're just not there with IPv6. It's just not, we're not there yet. So it was, it, was, it was tough. It was tough to pull off. Yeah, but hopefully soon. Right. And what's funny is, uh, go ahead and, uh, what, what's it, really funny is they've already done this at Caesars. So we show up, right? And we open the fridge and they've already got one, right? You reach in, and this happened to me last year in a foreign country. I just reached in to, you know, to say, well, what is this bottle in here? And you pull it out and all of a sudden click behind it, right? There was a sensor and then all of a sudden I'm, I'm, my bill's charged and I've got to drink this thing. Yes. But the, the IPv6 fridge was thought of a long time ago by the hotel industry. Well, it's not, I don't think it's not V6. I it's mean, not there, V6. There's a, yeah, there's a, I think there's a modem. The telematics part. Yeah, we found, found a little you know, modem behind it. But, uh, huh. Well, yeah, somebody, somebody already did it, so maybe we could work with them. So. We own your fridge, elite snackers. Hey, thanks, guys. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate it.